this is adulting on the spectrum. I am Andrew Comero, Autistic Certified Financial Planner. We co-run Adulting on the Spectrum Facebook group with my co-host, Eileen. Hey, I'm Eileen Lam. I'm an autistic author and photographer, and I'm also the mother of an autistic child. And with this podcast, we really want to highlight real voices of autistic adults, you know, not just the inspirational stories you hear on the news, but, you know, even our daily life, day to day life as autistic adults. And today we have Stephen Shore with us, and I'm going to let Andrew introduce him. It, today, our guest, Stephen Shore. Dr. Stephen Shore is a clinical assistant professor at the Ammon School of Education at Adelphi University, teaching courses in special education and autism. He focuses his work on matching well-thought-out educational practices to individual needs and promote fulfilling and productive lives for those with autism. Dr. Shore sits on the board of Autism Speaks. He consults throughout the world on educational and social inclusion, sensory processing challenges, bullying, as well as many other issues associated with successful transitioning into adulthood for those with autism. Dr. Shore's writings can regularly be seen on the media. He also shares his experience in his autobiography, Beyond the Wall, Personal Experience with Autism and Asperger Syndrome, and in Ask and Tell, Self-Advocacy and Disclosure for People on the Autism Spectrum. And if you still don't know who he is, he's the guy who said, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So, Steve, thanks for coming. All right. Well, it's great to be here with you. Thank you for being here. So we know there are differences in how autistic people like to identify themselves, right? And we want to ask all our guests, we're going to start with you, um, what identity language and pronouns do you prefer? All right. Well, I consider myself as an autistic person. Uh, autism uh, colors everything I do. It's not all I am, but it does, uh, it does affect uh, everything I do. Uh, autism, <laughs> I see autism as a set of characteristics that are not necessarily good, they're not necessarily bad, they just exist. Um, autism isn't something that I can like extract and say put into a bag and then leave the bag, I'll put the bag on a table and then hopefully don't forget my bag of autism when I, uh, you know, before, before I leave. Uh, also, I've uh, yet to hear about uh, people with Americanism, for example, or with uh, Russianism. So I'm just autistic. Uh, now that said, I know that there are you know, many people on the autism spectrum, which is kind of a nice middle ground between identity first, autistic person, or I am autistic, or he's autistic, um, and person first language, person with autism. And there's still plenty of us on the spectrum who prefer person first language. Uh, who like to be recognized for their human humanity first, who happen to have something. And so it's not something that I'm going to get into a battle with. And I think the best way to go about it is to do just as you did, I mean, and that is you ask the person on the spectrum who they prefer. I agree with that. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And is there any pronoun uh, you like to be Refer to? Oh, yeah. Him, pronoun, say. Um, I go for um, he, his, uh, him. Uh, just like with uh, uh, referring to somebody being on the autism spectrum. You know, people who prefer to be uh, use uh, various pronouns, I say, let's just go with it. And completely off script, uh, are there any nicknames that you've had that, you know, we you know, might be a little interesting and we could go back a long way, but, you know, are there any nicknames if you thought that you got? Yeah, well, in uh, college, people sometimes called me Moon Man. <laughs> and uh, why is that? figure out why. Uh, until somebody told me that, I guess the way my glasses were, sometimes they reflect uh, the light. 
uh, coming in their direction and people would see flashes of light instead of my eyes. I don't know how that makes somebody a moon man, but that's, uh, that's what they decided. And it didn't seem to be too bad of a thing to be referred to as. Out of all the nicknames you can get as a young adolescent in college, et cetera, moon man sounds pretty, pretty good. Yeah. How about you, Eileen? You ever? Yeah. No, nothing crazy. Um, I used to be called penguin because of the way my feet were. So, which was not very nice, you know, when you're like a, a little kid and kids are like calling you penguin, you know, I flapped my hands mm. too and I walked funny and yeah, not the best nickname, but it's okay. Well, penguins are pretty cool. Actually. Penguins yeah. Are, yeah. Penguins are awesome, right? Yeah. There, there's a meme I love that says money can't buy happiness, but money can buy a penguin. And have you ever seen somebody who owns a penguin who's not happy? So, you know. Yeah, that's a pretty cool one. Yeah. And even though you didn't ask, my nickname that I got when I was in uh, grade school was uh, F. Lee Bailey or Flea for short. For anyone who's not aware, he is the attorney who is largely credited with uh, making O.J. Simpson not guilty. So um, the opinionatedness nature of me has been long going. So that fits. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the first question is, is kind of like asking for more wish and wishes. It's a question and a question. Uh what is a question that you don't get asked often enough that you wish would people would ask you more? Um, I don't know. I never really, never really thought about that. Uh, you know, I seem to get questions. Uh, all the questions I get uh, seem to be uh, pretty good. To you know, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard to say. We might have to come back to that one. Or on the or on the flip side, are there any questions that you're tired of answering? Oh, um, well, you can flip it around, and uh, uh, sometimes they get questions like, uh, "Can autistic people drive?" And uh, my response to that is, uh, "I'm very good at driving. I can drive my way, my wife insane, for example, back <laughs> uh, to insanity." Uh, so I'm very good at driving. Uh, then also I can drive vehicles, I guess, just as well as the next person. Uh, I can drive in Manhattan if I need to, not be thrilled about doing it, but I can get around if I have to. Uh, but I'd much rather be riding my bicycle. Than <laughs> I, I actually, and one of the individuals who uh, works with me does a lot of presentations on autism and driving and a, a statistic slash study just like a couple weeks ago is actually individuals with autism are less likely to get in accidents than neurotypicals. According to this study, we're actually supposedly safer drivers according to that study. So not only can we drive, but uh, apparently we can drive better. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder why maybe it's because we're more careful because we're more afraid and we're so aware that, you know, we have, difficulties maybe with like noise i know when i'm driving i'm always afraid there's gonna be like a loud honk someone honking yeah. at me and so maybe we're more aware of that and so we're more careful you know when other people are so confident and they can i don't know that's very cool study yeah that is yeah so on to the next question oh, okay you you are part of a you are on the board of autism speaks um why did you make that decision and how do you feel about the direction of the organization? All right, well, I decided to join the Board of Autism Speaks because I, um, having been involved with Autism Speaks for a while beforehand, um, working on various projects, sometimes grant projects, uh, uh, reviewing uh, research proposals, working on uh, various uh, toolkits. A number of in the organization uh, who uh, seem to notice, uh, who are aware that uh, autism is something that's here to stay. And it's something that we need to work with as opposed to against. 
And the organization, when Autism Speaks, even started this way. It's working against autism. Autism is something to be cured, eliminated. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, but I had seen changes. I saw changes occurring you know, within the organization. And then by the time uh, you know, Brian Kelly um, asked me if I would sit on the board, uh, it was quite an honor. I mean, the first thing that he told me when I talked to him during that conversation uh, was that he had a 19-year-old uh, child on the spectrum, young adult, and he didn't want to change his kid. He just wants his kid to be happy. And he's happy with his family, and his fat family is happy with him, so what more What more could he want? And then that told me that Autism Speaks uh, was ready to move to the next level and to work with autism, uh, to accept autistic characteristics. And to see what we can do with those characteristics so that we may appreciate autistic individuals for what we can contribute to society and also ready to take action in order to make that occur. One example is the, is the change of the mission statement from cure of autism to awareness and acceptance of autistic people and lifelong supports. So you're pretty happy with the direction the organization is going? Yeah, I am. Yeah, we've got, a long, we've got a long way to go still, but we're moving in the right direction and we've been great strides. Yeah, and I mean, how long has Autism Speaks been using identity first, right? Can we credit you with that? Or in general, that's that's pretty good <laughs> progress too, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're using identity first, the language, the uh, they're inv they involve autistic people in many aspects of the organization, whether it's you know, the vice president of support and services, or Valerie Paradis, who is autistic, you know, whether it's me, who is on the board as an autistic individual, Valerie is on the board too, but she left the board to you know, move to that administrative position. And then certainly uh, talking with you, Andrew and Eileen, autistic people, are involved with autism speaks. I, I Eileen, mean, I can't remember if you have the next one. There's no A or E next to it, so I, I can. Uh. <laughs> it's so arti autistic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so you've been an, av an advocate for a long time. If you were to go back in time, what would you change and why? No, I don't know if I change much. Uh, going back, maybe not even anything except maybe making uh, greater efforts uh, to uh, help people understand uh, what autism is and what autism isn't. Yeah. Do you think things have changed since you started advocating? Like, I know we've just talked about how, you know, Autism Speaks has changed their mission statement from like finding a cure and, you know, the have more autistic people on board and all of that. But in general, do you think things are changing for the best? Yeah, I think things are changing for the best. I remember when starting to give presentations, I get a lot of questions about you know, toilet training, whether autistic people could drive cars and things like that. And now, um, uh, the questions are more focused on you know, what can we do to help or work with you know, autistic people. And that's uh, and moving along with what I call the four A's of autism, uh, which I mentioned in part. When I was getting started, I think we were in the awareness stage, autism awareness. We have autism awareness day, autism awareness month, all kinds of autism awareness things. And it's gotten to a point where it's, uh, April has become Don't Forget Your Autistic Month. <laughs> and so uh, what that does is that it's built a solid foundation. Upon, once we now recognize uh, autism in our midst, whether it's in education, it could be at work, it could be at home, in community, uh, it builds that solid foundation uh, for us to work with 
the characteristics of that to the acceptance piece. You know, the realization that autistic people are autistic for life. Uh, we can't change. We don't want to change these core characteristics. But uh, through research, through practice, through understanding, we can work with the characteristics. So an example might be, uh, suppose you have a grade school child who is not, not motivated to do math. Uh, maybe the child doesn't like to do math. Uh, because they're not good at it. And they don't really see any uh, use for it. So commonly, uh, somebody would take the, um, an interest in the thing. What is the child interested in? All right, the child's interested in flying, using flight simulators uh, on a computer. All right, we now identify that as a, as a motivator, as a reinforcement to you these uh, behavioral speak. And then what would happen is uh, once that uh, activity is identified as a reinforcer, it gets taken away. Uh, but you can earn it back if you do things that people want you to do, such as do not. And um, one problem with that is, I see is that you're taking away the, some, something that somebody lives for, you know, almost punishing them for liking it, but you can earn it back. Now, if you do what you're supposed to do in math class for the first 20 minutes, uh, then you get 10 minutes on the flight simulator. Uh, however, as we move towards acceptance, we're seeing more people, increasing numbers of educators and others, uh, still looking for these interests and then finding a way to use the flight simulator to teach mathematics. There's plenty of mathematics involved in flying airplanes. And what that does is it sets us up for A number three, which is appreciation. The autistic individuals are valued for what we can contribute to society. You see some of the, uh, you see a number of IT companies such as Microsoft, Apple, SAP, and so on, actively seeking autistic individuals because they know that a number of us can do things in IT that other people either can't do or we just do them much better. Now that said, it's also important to keep in mind that a minority of us are IT geeks. It's a myth that we're all IT geeks. It's a minority. A big enough group so that IT-ish type companies uh, took notice and they make a lot of publicity about it. But my question always is when I hear about all of this IT uh, geekery, uh, what about everybody else? What about those of us who have skills in other areas? What about those of us who perhaps need more supports? In, for example, transportation, maintaining one's daily schedule, perhaps communication. And to that end, I know of a fellow in Florida who doesn't speak very much, he uses a communication device. He does need support for to get to places, to maintain the schedule, various things. However, he's got this curious fascination with taking hot clothes out of a dryer and folding them perfectly. And so what that has been uh, transformed into is him spending entire days in a hot laundromat pulling clothes out of a dryer and folding them better and faster than anybody else. Uh, <laughs> this person is uh, fulfilled and satisfied and productive with their life. They enjoy it probably doing something that, uh, that would likely uh, bore the daylights out of most people, but this person likes it. And people certainly appreciate how good their laundry. And there are many people who appreciate how good their laundry. So that's another example of uh, appreciation for an autistic person. And that fourth A is action. And action is all the work that we have to put into recognizing autism when it exists, uh, uh, understanding and accepting the characteristics and working with them, and then appreciate what we can contribute to society. So uh, different um, organizations, people, and even entire countries are uh, at various stages of uh, these forces. Four steps or four stages, four A's of autism. 
I, I, I think I've heard you, you speak several times and I've heard um, a, the story of the person in Florida. And it's such a great just every time, uh, you know, an example of, you know, when somebody's passionate about somebody and something and everyone is different. So thank you. Yeah. No, you're welcome. What 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 advice would you give to the autistic advocates of today looking to advocate? And even more specifically, what issues do you see that harm our advocacy efforts? And what could we be doing better? Uh, well, for those who want to engage in advocacy, uh, I would say look to where advocacy is needed. In some places, areas where that's needed um, is... Uh, in a general sense, is an effective transition to adulthood, a successful transition to adulthood. And so that means employment, relationships, uh, continuing education, and uh, where we live, uh, residential. So those are big picture things. Uh, however, it's also possible just to look at your own situation, perhaps engage in self-advocacy as needed, well, look to the person next to you, or another autistic person, and maybe they're not autistic, uh, but they still need help in advocating for their needs and communicating their needs in a way that somebody else can understand and provide support. And I think that's a key thing uh, for us to keep in mind, is to be continually looking for ways to advocate in a way that the people we're advocating to I can understand. And when asking for accommodations or greater mutual understanding, doing that in a way that's reasonable. So, for example, uh, let us suppose I am uh, being shown a new workspace by my supervisor. And I, you know, supervisor is showing me the workspace. And I see that it's lit with recessed lighting fixtures. Well, one thing that I know autism means to me, and that's also an important foundation, what does autism mean to you or to the individual? And what, one thing autism means to me is that recessed lighting fixtures and I don't get along. Because as they shine down from the ceiling, you know, to me, it's probably like looking into a spotlight for most other people. So... How do I deal with that? Well, most people may think that this has a fashion statement, and in some ways it is. In many ways it is, and it's always good to support your university while you're at it. So that needs to be both our university path. But really, it's an accommodation. And that is what helps me get to new places that have recess lighting fixtures. So back to the example. I notice the room is lit with recess lighting fixtures, and... That's the first step, scanning that environment for challenges. And you can do that on your own behalf or you can do it on somebody else's behalf. And then you've got to advocate. That's the second step, the advocacy effort. Well, gee, I noticed that nobody in the office is wearing a hat. However, I wonder if it's okay if I wear my hat in the office. And there it is, the advocacy effort, one of two sentences, easy to understand. Uh, it didn't get to a point where I was overloaded by recessed lighting fixtures and had a meltdown. I had that from happening, which is good. And then uh, and it's something that the supervisor can easily support. And uh, they don't even have to supply a house because I've got my own. Well, then it's the third step. And that's the disclosure piece. Why am I asking for an accommodation for greater understanding? And so now it's time to disclose, and I would engage in what I call a partial disclosure. And I would focus solely on the aspect of autism that's presenting the challenge. Well, gee, these lights, they feel really bright to me. They give me a headache. I must have sensitive eyes. And just leave it at that. And that would be an example of self-advocacy. And likewise, if you see somebody having difficulty with the same challenge, you could conceivably advocate for them in a similar manner. 
Have you ever had to, was that a true story or was that just an example? Have you ever had to ask for accommodation because of the lights in the, in the workspace and was that successful? Um, uh, no, actually I haven't, but I'm pretty lucky where I work at a university and I have my own office and I can choose whether to turn the fluorescent lights on uh, above my head or not. Use the actual lighting and bring in my own minute. So I'm pretty lucky. Uh, sometimes, uh, I, you know, I take my students to an example of, uh, sensory overload. Actually, there are many activities that we do, but one that I like to do is, you know, before the students come into the room, I turn the audio equipment at full volume. And I know I'm not going to blast their ears out. But <laughs> what happens when you do that, especially in a classroom or anywhere with this amplification, is that there'll probably be a good amount of buzzing. And most people, when they walk into the room, they will subconsciously ignore that buzzing. But their brain is working. And it's working pretty hard to suppress the buzzing so that they can listen to whatever I have to say. And then a couple minutes into the class, they suddenly go to the volume and turn it all the way down. Oh, gee, doesn't that feel so much better? And students feel much more relaxed and relieved. And now they understand why. Because they've been so busy tuning out the distracting sound. For the autistic person, they, you can turn up those distracting sounds by a factor of 100 or 1,000. That, that's just really interesting. I'm just thinking about that. So... And, uh, it, it even now, and even now I'm still learning personally some things that bother me, like the sound example, right? So sometimes it, you know, the self-realization that can happen, right? You may not know that this is something that you, you know, need, right? You're trying to automatically kind of adapt to it. Yeah. Next one, me. Um, so you love to travel, talk, and present in other countries. Right. And there hasn't been a lot of traveling over the past year since COVID. How have you been, um, you know, handling that? What have you been doing? Uh, have you adapted? All right. Well, I've had to adapt because uh, there was really no choice. So I remember in uh, March... Eighth, I think it was. Uh, we all got booted off the camps. And we were told that uh, we're starting spring break one week early uh, due to the pandemic, but prepare to be back after the spring break and we'll carry on. And I kind of knew we weren't going to be back for a while. That's what I sensed. So I took some materials home that I know I'd be needing for at least the rest of the semester. And I go back, and now I've been home for about a year. Before that time, I was traveling to a foreign country about once a month. And I presented on autism to 51 countries you know, to that point. And so a lot of travel, and I enjoy it. And uh, the way I describe my schedule is that I spend half my time at Adelphi University, which is in New York. Half my time at home in Boston, because that's where my house is and my life is there. And then the third half at conferences. And somehow the three halves equal a whole. And so now it's just a matter of doing all of my teaching and all of my presentations on Zoom, Zoom-like software. And it has been an adaptation. And then I realized that uh, there are some things that I need to be much more intentional about. And that is, one is routines. Uh, keeping my routines the same as much as possible. So in the morning, it's getting up, having breakfast, just like anybody else would, just like I always do. But instead of riding my bicycle to work, now it's just walking to the room where the computer happens to be. And either teaching or having meetings at my university or giving workshops, presentations, or even uh, podcasts very much like this. So what that also meant 
is that there's a lot less movement. And a lot of people talk about the uh, COVID-15, COVID-19, COVID-25, uh, whatever number after COVID. And what it refers to is uh, the amount of weight that some people have gained because they haven't been moving. So it means I have to be much more intentional in my movements. And that translates to uh, spinning my elliptical bike for about an hour and a half every other day. Because all of that incidental exercise that everybody gets going from between work and home and then running errands and walking around at work from one office to the next, all of that is gone. So you have to work again. And likewise with social interaction, uh, there is this myth that autistic people don't like to be, don't like to socialize. I think that myth may come from the fact that uh, so many of us have such bad experiences in grade school attempting to socialize and have it ending up in bullying or just some, some poor result. And maybe the autistic person just says, well, you know, this socialization thing isn't really cracked up the way everybody says it is, so I'm going to give up. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people because all the autistic adults I know, they seem to want to interact with others just as much as everybody else. So insofar as traveling or not traveling, uh, the way I see it is you, know, you just have to make do with and be happy with what you have. And uh, I'm lucky to have a home so I can hang out at home. Uh, so an unprecedented period of time. Uh, been home for a year now with my wife. Fortunately, we like each other. So that works. I know that the pandemic has been a strain on some couples. You're enforced togetherness and uh, things aren't working out as well but I liked out you know, we like each other we're doing a lot more cooking at home so I'm just um, enjoying what is and it's like that when I travel too so people sometimes ask me do I miss home when I'm traveling and I say no I just make my home wherever I am whether it's in Qatar or Israel or China or us, Australia, wherever I happen to be. That's really impressive. I find traveling very, very difficult, you know, because I'm not in my environment. I mean, if you have any tips to share on how to make your home somewhere else, you know, I think it's something that a lot of autistic adults struggle with, like being away from home and our routine and the things we know. Um, do you have any, uh, any tips yeah, Anything that could help? Oh, let's yeah. hear it. Oh, I got all, all kinds of ideas. <laughs> uh, one is uh, uh, for those of us who like to systemize, and in some ways, Simon Baron Cohen was right in saying that autistic people like to system systematize, but the key word is some of us, maybe even most of us, uh, but not all of us. But for those of us who enjoy uh, learning and understanding systems, travel is one big system. So getting to the airport, it's pretty much the same wherever you, wherever you are. Either someone's going to drive you there or you can come to Uber or if there's a train uh, that you can uh, take, you can take the train. Uh, airports are the same everywhere. Uh, you've got to get into the lobby first. In some countries... Uh, you have to show uh, an ID and a boarding pass just to get into the lobby before you can get to the check-in agent. And so you have to be prepared for that in some countries. Uh, once you get there, the check-in procedure is the same wherever you go. It's really a matter of practice. And likewise, packing. I've gotten it to a point where I can pack for an international trip in about 20 minutes. Because I've got the routines down and how many of what I need to bring. And uh, I also don't check luggage. Uh, if it doesn't fit in the overhead, it doesn't go. And if you really need something that you didn't bring, you could probably buy it wherever you are. You just do it out because uh, you're not going to be wherever that place is uh, forever. Uh, when I get to if I travel to a foreign country where I don't speak the language, I make sure that 
uh, the conference organizer or some representative meets me at the airport uh, because I don't know enough Russian, Chinese, Japanese, and various other languages uh, where I travel in order to get from one place to another. People have always, uh, have always arranged to meet me to, at the airport or, uh, or drive me back you know, to the airport. So that, uh, that relieves a lot of stress. I remember one time, uh, almost canceling a presentation in France. Uh, um, my wife and I had traveled to Paris. And I got in touch with someone who ran an Asperger group there. And she suggested that I could take, uh, take the subway to get from where I was to wherever she was. And I told her that I don't think this is going to happen because I don't know French and I'm not going to take a subway. Uh, to a place that I don't know in a language that I don't understand. So maybe we ought to do it another time. Uh, anyway, she, uh, she came to the hotel and picked me up. So it's also a matter of growing boundaries too, as to what you will do and what you won't do. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you've got a lot of experience there. So that, that helps, I'm sure, when you do it a lot to get oh, yeah. used, used to it. Yeah. We were wondering with Andrew, we were talking the other day and you told me that you're into music. Um, have yeah. you been working on anything music related? Um, not really. Uh, but I've been uh, uh, listening to a lot of music on YouTube. Uh, we discovered um, a song by Schubert. Actually, it was his first composition uh, called The Earl Connect, uh, The Earl King. And it's an interesting piece. It only lasts about three and a half minutes, but inside those three and a half minutes, uh, there's four or five different characters that one singer has to represent. Uh, four or five, depending on how you call them. So I've just been looking into that and analyzing it harmonically and thematically. But sometimes I just get into a particular piece of music. Yeah, I do that too. Do you, Andrew? Yeah. And actually I, I really like music where I can understand the words well. So music yeah. that has good lyrics is important, very important to me, which is why I will like some hip hop, but also like some folk music, right. Or, you know, some alternative, but where I want there to be almost more of a story, right. I really grew up on um, you know, Harry Chapin, Simon and Garfunkel, and just a lot of music yeah. where, you know, yeah. you can hear what they're saying. I, I really like listening to the lyrics almost a lot more than, you know, the other uh, pieces. So yeah, I, think, I think that's important. If it's a song, if it's words, you really need to be able to hear. Is there anything, uh, you know, else you're working on, you know, new or exciting or something that you'd want to share that we should be aware of? Well, I'm getting uh, 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 one of the most uh, satisfying uh, things that I'm doing or activities that I'm engaged, engaged in is uh, research that is, uh, or I should call it participatory research. And that is involving autistic people in all aspects of research. So taking it beyond, taking research beyond studying autistic people, although that's, that's certainly a fine thing to do. Uh, uh, but we also, for studying autism, uh, shouldn't autistic people be involved in that research if we're so interested? And so to that, a colleague and I uh, spent two years in a patient care outcome research Institute uh, grant award. We're doing that very thing, where we uh, where we endeavor to find the answer to uh, what is the greatest medical challenge, what is the greatest health challenge facing autistic individuals. And my colleague and I uh, felt we could probably we could do some research, write up a paper, and probably get it published. But wouldn't it be much better? to ask the autistic community that very same question and get the answers from autistic people. And while we're at it, why don't we involve autistic people 
in an authentic way in all aspects of the research, uh, ranging from the, from the conception to the design of the research to implementation, analyzing the data afterwards and dissemination. And what can we do as part of this engagement award to develop some protocols for authentic, meaningful engagement of autistic people in research? So those are the two parts of the project. The first, the science research-ish part, where we had a couple of conferences, we distributed surveys, we had focus groups, and what we learned is that mental health, access to mental health supports is most on the minds of autistic individuals. And that was validated by a similar study done by a group in the United Kingdom called Autistic Health. And they found the same. We didn't know, we, neither, neither group knew the other one was working on this subject. Uh, but we both came up with the same results. So that was pretty cool. And then the second part, the engagement piece, we developed and published a, a compensation engagement guide. And the idea being that the autistic person who's involved should be paid the same as anybody else. Equal work. Equal pay. And also for engaging autistic people, we need to be aware of the accommodations that may need to be made. So, Eileen, if I ask you to come to a focus group, it may be like about 88% of us on the spectrum who are under or unemployed. Uh, that those four or six dollars that it costs to take the subway to get to wherever we need, we need to be to participate. Uh, that may be too much for the budget. But we need to be aware of it. And we need to pay the person for their participation, just as we pay anybody else. Uh, we also need to make accommodations in terms of wayfinding. You know, many autistic and non-autistic people who get to a building where something is supposed to occur, occur and that's kind of where the directions end. So where in the building is the activity? going to take place. So we have to be mindful of that. And also mindful of the diversity in the way we communicate. So we're communicating as talkies. We're talking back and forth. That's how most of the world communicates. However, there are many of us on the spectrum who don't have the uh, physiology, the neurology to speak. So they communicate in other ways, with an assistive communication device, for example. And communicating uh, with an assistive communication device often takes more time. So what accommodations are we going to make so that people who don't speak can still participate in all aspects of research? So these are just a couple of things that we got into with this project. And now there's increasing numbers of projects out there that are focusing on authentic engagement of autistic individuals in research. Yeah, I, I love that. I was going to ask you, ask you earlier how we could best advocate for people who use, you know, better accommodations. My son is nonverbal and he uses uh, AAC to communicate, but most people get confused when they see a child running with an iPad um, and saying, I want, you know, through the speaker, of a tablet. Um, so that's really interesting that you're working on that. Uh, I think we tend to forget sometimes about the nonverbal and autistic population and those who communicate differently, you know, and that's really important. Um, which brings me to my next question. I, you know, I'm an advocate, I'm autistic, but my son is autistic too. And just like your quote, which is probably my favorite, by the way, you know, if you've met okay. an autistic individual, you've met one autistic individual because I see it every day with, with my son. And so I advocate for myself, but I also try to advocate for my son. And because of that, you know, online, uh, as you know, probably, um, you can get a lot of hate because sure. the autistic community is very divided. And I know that, you know, you've gotten some Hey, too, and how do you handle it? Well, I just do what I think is the right thing to do. So a, a good example of a 
causing a lot of consternation in the autism community. The autistic community was you know, when I joined the board of Autism Speaks, which is the organization that is supposed to be the enemy of autistic people. And uh, yeah, there was a time that it was, actually, um, when it first came on the scene. Uh, but people change and organizations can change. And uh, Autism Speaks doesn't promote cure. It doesn't, there, there is no conversation in the boardroom or anywhere else that I know of where people long for the day when there's no more autism. That is, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. So I just, I, I just, I realize that uh, I just need to do what I think is the right thing to do. And that is best overall for autistic people. And uh, getting back to that second, you know, to that second A, um, acceptance, uh, which means working with characteristics. Uh, there are many people who work against autism speaks, who protest autism speaks. And uh, there are many things that autism speaks uh, did in the past that were worth protesting for. And I supported those protests. Uh, but there also comes a time uh, when you need to uh, look for and become aware of uh, what good is happening in an organization. And working with an organization as opposed to against it. And in that way, I think I can do a lot more good and affect a lot more positive change by working with autism students. And, uh, you know, there are some amazing things are happening. Have happened and then will continue to happen in autism speaks by engaging with as opposed to against. Yeah. Progress, not perfection. I love that quote too, because, you know, yeah. clearly we're going in the right direction and we should, you know, celebrate this and not always think back about the past when mistakes were made, but, you know, change is happening. And I think we really should focus on that and we can keep doing better together. And I love that you're getting involved, that you're involved with Autism Speaks. And Andrew, do you want to ask the last question? Did we? Oh, the, uh, oh sorry. Before that, um, I, I just feel that's the reason I, you know, want to help because I'm thinking, you know, from my experiences, you know, with dealing with, you know, autism speaks skeptical, like any organization, there's inefficiencies, there's efficiencies, there's good people, there's people I like, maybe there's people, you know, I, I don't like as much, but I, I felt, you know, that if it wasn't, if nobody engages with them, right, then it's going to be really hard for the, for autism speaks to listen to people if there's nobody to listen to. And, I found a surprising reception and I would rather, you know, it be me to try to advance the, or I lean and advance the conversation for the good of all autistic people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's work, let's work with as opposed to against and get a lot more done. Yeah. And or organizations change over time. Things change. Names stay right. the same. Okay. So... I think uh, the, the last question for the roundup. So yeah. ha, you are married, uh, as am I, well, to a neurotypical wife. Any particular stories or awkwardness that comes to mind or, or anything else that you would like to share? Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I guess uh, how we met. Um, uh, that that probably be a good uh, a good place to start. So with a little background, um, dating. Uh, I never understood dating. I never could quite figure it out. All of those nonverbal cues and hidden curriculum uh, that's involved. And uh, probably the only thing that has that, that approaches the amount of hidden curriculum of dating is probably a job interview. And so I never understood the cues until maybe way too late. So maybe so, that somebody was interested in dating. So an example, in, in um, undergraduate school, after spending a lot of time with this lady, she told me that she likes hugs and backups. 
And I thought, wow, gee, this is great. She's a nice person. And as someone who is uh, proprioceptively hypo-sensitive or undersensitive, which translates to being a sensory seeker, so that, I was the kid who would spin around on anything I could spin around on. I would spend all day on a roller coaster. That's why another reason why I like traveling, because airplanes are just huge sensory integration machines. And I like going to turbulence. So, gee, I've got this brand new friend who also doubles as a source of deep pressure, like a temple grand and squeeze machine. All right, I'm all in. Uh, after a while, she seemed to get really frustrated. And after a lot of discussion, I realized she wanted to be my girlfriend. Well, I wasn't interested. But what this did tell me is that there was this whole area of communication that we refer to as being non-verbal, which, depending upon the study you read, could make up to 93% of the total interaction package. Now, speaking of non-verbal, um, Eileen, you mentioned uh, your son, who is non-verbal. Um, I prefer to use the term non-speaking because... Verbal communication is a lot more than just speaking. Uh, someone who is nonverbal doesn't understand the concept of language. Uh, if your son is running around with an iPad and making it uh, say things that he wants and to communicate, uh, then he understands language. But something with his neurology is keeping him from speaking at this time. Well, that's why I like to think of the term non-speaking rather than non-verbal. But anyways, uh, back to my situation. Spent hours reading books on body language, uh, creating dummies, uh, building a lexicon of non-verbal communication uh, that I could deploy maybe at a later date. So we fast forward to uh, graduate school. And now I'm spending a lot of time with this man. And initially reviewing each other's homeworks and then doing things socially. And then one day at a beach, he suddenly gave me a kiss, a hug, and held my hand. And now I have the social story down. And it went something like this. If a woman hugs you, kisses you, and holds your hand all at about the same time, then it probably means they want to be a girlfriend. <laughs> if that's the case, you better have an answer right away. Do not confuse a potential girlfriend for a temple grand and squeeze machine and you could either say yes, no, or further investigation and analysis is indicated. Well, it kind of seemed to be a good thing to do. And uh, uh, we've been married for over 30 years. Must uh, have been the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it seemed to be the right thing to do. But again, I depended on her to provide the cues uh, to let me know that she was interested in so I, I was pretty lucky in that regard. After you were, to, after you've been together for a little while, are there things that you've discovered that you've learned that really just help make that, you know, an understanding that, you know, about yourself or assumptions that, you know, really helped you guys communicate a lot better? Yeah. Uh, one is that we need to verbalize a lot of things. So there's less of this uh, mythical mind reading that couples are supposed to have. But we have to talk a lot of things up. Uh, also, uh, nobody says that we have to follow conventions in terms of communicating. The standard practices when people are communicating, especially talking about perhaps emotional rated, thing, rated things, is that you look at each other, you make a lot of eye contact, you're probably sitting across from each other. But who says that you have to sit across from each other? Maybe you could sit side by side. Or maybe you could have discussions in a dark room where nobody's looking at each other. Or perhaps you could even be communicating through text messaging where something can be written out and then we can take as much processing time as we need to reviewing what was written as opposed to verbal communication, which is temporary in nature. Somebody says it, you have to memorize it. 
If you keep it in memory, you're good. If you don't, then it's just gone. Yeah. What, what, one of my favorite realizations is when I was diagnosed later, I realized, we realized, me and my wife realized that we had been having entire arguments that we didn't have because I stopped speaking. I finished the sentence in my head, uh -huh. I didn't realize it. And she finished it in her head for me. So there was a few years where we just assumed we were having arguments and we were having these conversations with each other that we never had. Mm -hmm. And the, the awareness of that, just the awareness in itself, not saying that doesn't happen. Right. But the, you know, was so huge and it's like how over all this time. Right. But yeah. it's something relatively simple, but that, that makes a, a big difference when you think someone's arguing with you and they're really not, you know? Oh, yeah, it's a huge difference. What about you, Eileen? Yeah, I can relate to that uh, so much. A lot of the time, I think there's an issue and there's no issue, or he thinks there's an issue with me because of the way my face looks, for instance. Or he's like, You're, why are you mad right now? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm happy. And it's just, you know, like facial expression is also something big that I had to have the talk with Willie about my husband because he would read things on my face that I wasn't feeling and it's things that I don't um, have control over I guess or my facial expressions don't match how I'm feeling and it would create arguments for things that didn't even exist because I wasn't mad in the first place you know so yeah it's it's nice to be able to communicate that's what Stephen was saying like we just need to Talk about it more, you know, communicate, communicate, communicate to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, that makes sense because, uh, yeah, autistic people um, have difficulty um, perceiving and processing nonverbal communication. Uh, then it would only make sense that the nonverbal communication we express is going to be different. To wrap, wrap things up, we're doing these for every guest. We're doing a quick fire questions. Uh -huh. So what, what we'd like you to do is just come up with, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind, you know, answer, you know, relatively quickly. There's no wrong answers. Um, and so we have a few of these. So I'm just going to go through. All right. Uh, fill in the blank. Your autism is... Uh, is great. What is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? Uh, find and use your strengths for your success. What do you like to do to relax? Uh, listen to music. And, and what is your favorite food? Uh, depends. Uh, right now, I, uh, I like a uh, uh, right now, it's fish. What is your favorite film? Uh, Temple Grandin. And wh who is your favorite artist or album? Uh, favorite is uh, Igor Stravinsky. So our, our next guest, you you know, and you know for a long time, uh, Bridget, what is a question you would like us to ask our next guest? Oh, well, I'd like you to ask uh, Bridget, uh, what is the most important aspect that has brought you to where you are today? That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on Adulting on the Spectrum. You were so great, and it was a pleasure uh, talking with you. So if there's... Anything you want to add anywhere we can find you online? Uh, now is a good time to tell our listener. Oh, sure. Well, if you want to find me online, uh, doing a Google search or whatever your favorite search engine is, we'll, we'll do pretty well. Just type in my name, Stephen Shore, and autism, and ask me to see them out of that. And if you want to go direct to my website, uh, you can go to www.drstephenshore.com. I'm also on Facebook, 
and LinkedIn. And you are in our adulting on the spectrum Facebook group. That's right. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> You're one of the first people in, I think. So oh, okay. Yeah. That's great. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank oh, you. No Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much.